Okay, hello all, and welcome to today's, uh, I think it'll be quite an exciting Fish for Thought session on uh, sustainable and accessible fish feeds for small-scale fish farmers, where we will be focusing on uh, the findings um, of our research on nutritious pond feeds and local ingredients for fish feeds. Uh, my name is uh, Mike. Mike Phillips. I'm the director for the CGR research program on fish agri-food systems, known simply as FISH. I see we have over 60 um, people joining us rapidly, virtually from around the, the world. So big, big welcome. Whilst we wait for um, people to join, um, let me start off and direct your attention to some housekeeping rules that uh, should be on the screen uh, right, right now. I'm sure many of you have seen these uh, before, um, but quickly recap the, um, the, the points here. So for audience uh, members, your, your cameras and microphones will be switched off by default throughout the event. In the second half of the event, um, we'll have a round of, of Q&A sessions with the, with the panel members, and we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. To keep the webinar as engaging as possible, um, our colleague, um, Killian Chari, who is a postdoctoral researcher in aquatic food systems analysis at Wageningen University in research. We'll also be moderating and answering some of your questions. Thanks in advance, Gillian. So please do uh, direct your questions into the Q&A box and, do, and only they'll be monitored and responded to. Um, we'll be sharing some key links related to the presentation and discussion in, in the comments box. So please keep an eye on that as, as well. The event's been recorded and screenshots will be taken for record and promotion uh, purposes. And uh, we invite you to subscribe to World Fish newsletter to receive the recording and some post event materials and the link to subscribe will be provided in the in the in the chat okay so big welcome again thanks for joining i see we have over 80 participants uh, now um the fish crp our program is a multidisciplinary research for development program intended to develop and implement research and innovation that uh, enhances the contribution of both small-scale fisheries and aquaculture to poverty reduction, improving food and nutrition security, and enhancing environmental management and natural resource systems throughout Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. The FISH program is led by World Fish in partnership with the International Water Management Institute, Wageningen University and Research, our, our partner for this webinar today, but also James Cook University and the University of Greenwich. Throughout this year of uh, the FISH program, we are developing a set of strategic briefs that um, collate and share the learning, the outcomes and impacts from the past few years of the program, and to stimulate action and investment into fish and aquatic foods and some of the emerging innovations from the, uh, the, the fish program. So today we're happy to um, announce the results and uh, a brief on our research on sustainable and accessible fish feeds for small scale fish farmers. The link to the brief will be shared um, at the end of the, uh, the, the, the webinar. And we invite you to look at that brief for more details of the presentation today. 
a big thanks to all the contributors, partners, reviewers of the research um, over the past few years on feeds and nutrition within the fish research program, and a big thanks to all for attending today. So let's get started with a presentation about the research on sustainable feeds and feeding practices from the lead authors and leads of the research. Uh, Professor Mark Verdicum from who, Wageningen University in Re Research. Mark is an aquaculture ecology professor at the university. And then from Worldfish, Dr. Rodrigue Yossa, who's the fish feeds and nutrition lead scientist at our organization. So thank you very much again for participating today. And over to you, Rodrigue and Mark for the kickoff presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mike Phillips for this uh, introduction to the FCRP and also for, uh, for launching the uh, strategic brief. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So um, here I'm going to present the research agenda on fish feeds and nutrition at Worldfish. So we partners, uh, we developed a research agenda that was based on uh, three uh, building blocks, uh, namely the sustainable ingredients, the nutrient requirements of fish on the system, and better management practice uh, guides. Uh, the focus was on local and novel uh, ingredients, uh, macro and micronutrient requirements of improved strengths of fish, and the development of better management practice guide for local and global uses. And all this uh, led to uh, the ingredient database, uh, the validation of the nutritious pond concept, and the dissemination of uh, better management practice guide. So I will focus more on the ingredient database and the better management practice guide dissemination in my presentation. And Professor Mark Verdegan will talk about the nutrition pond concept. Uh, before uh, talking about the uh, local ingredients, I would like to uh, mention the fact that with partners, we established uh, feed uh, uh, related research facilities across uh, Africa and Asia. So for example, in Egypt, in collaboration with Creating, we uh, established a fish nutrition lab. And in Zambia, at the Natural Resource Development College, we also established a wet lab where we work with Ale Aqua. In Bangladesh, we build a research uh, wet lab at Kulna University in collaboration with the HUS, and we also rehabilitated some ponds for research in the ponds. And in Penang, Malaysia, we build a research facility that is adapted to uh, fish feeds research, especially for digestibility experiments. But the work on local ingredients effectively started by uh, an assessment of existing and potential feed resources in three Asian countries, namely uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Malaysia, and also three African countries, namely uh, Nigeria, Zambia, and Egypt. So following this assessment, uh, 15 ingredients were uh, selected on which we did not only analyze the nutrient content, but we also studied the digestibility of the nutrients that are contained in these ingredients. And uh, of the 15 selected ingredients that already exist on 10 of these ingredients, and uh, uh, this data are uh, published. And we are also uh, working on uh, the five other ingredients and there is a manuscript which is under review and that we put all the data at the disposal of uh, the public. But in addition to that, we are also developing uh, an open access uh, database for the ingredients. And we are starting with these 15 ingredients. So right now, this is what it looks like, it's still an Excel file where we do not only have information, as I said, on the nutrient uh, composition of the ingredients, but also on the uh, digestibility, uh, apparent digestibility coefficient of the macronutrients, and also for some specific uh, nutrients, we also have apparent digestibility coefficient of micronutrients. And all these will be uh, packaged and include uh, in existing online open access database, such as uh, those of the feed calculator and the international aquaculture feed formulation database. Now, talking about better management practice guides, in collaboration with the TAD uh, Aquaculture Compact in Africa, led by uh, World Fish and funded by the African Development Bank, we developed a uh, global extension manual on quality, low-cost 
fish feed uh, from national production, which is now uh, distributed across the, the world. And we also uh, uh, worked in collaboration with IITA in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to develop another BMP in French on bon pratique en matière de nutrition et d'alimentation des poissons, good management practices in fish feeds and nutrition specific to the Re Democratic Republic of the Congo. And other ways to disseminate the BMPs, we provided training to big millers in Africa and Asia. So for example, in Bangladesh on the 21st August 2019, uh, we gave a training uh, to about feed, uh, 50 big millers in Dhaka on aquaculture nutrition challenges and beyond. And through that again, we provided a training to 30 feed millers from uh, uh, five English speaking countries in Africa on formulating balanced diet for aquaculture on the 23rd September 2020. And we also gave the same training in French to uh, 30 feed millers from uh, six French speaking African countries on the 30th September 2020. So now I will pass it over to Dr. Mark Redigan, who will be talking about uh, the nutritious farm concept. Over to you, please, Dr. Mark Redigan. Thank you, uh, Rodrigue. Um, so I will introduce the concept of nutritious fund farming. Next slide, please. Um, we decided in the beginning of the program to focus on ponds because more than 60% of the global aquaculture animal production is produced in ponds. And actually, when we focus on smallholders or at, uh, uh, rural uh, farmers, the vast majority of them work in ponds. Next slide, please. Um, when we are uh, working in ponds, production today is driven by formulated feeds. Formulated feeds are uh, formulated targeting the animal that is grown. And 20 to 40% of the nutrients end up in the animal, which means that 60 to 80% becomes waste. And that waste is difficult to degrade because it's low in carbon and energy, and that leads to unhealthy water quality and unhealthy fish. Next, please. And we all know that because it, uh, a lot of products like probiotic, prebiotic, that uh, fertilizers, disinfectants are used to either boost the immunity of the animals that we grow or to keep the water quality in the system good to production. Next slide, please. And so we, we thought, why don't we try to formulate feeds? And during formulation, we think about the animal, so the fish or the shrimp that we grow. And in the same time, we also think about the waste that will be generated from the fish or shrimp eating the feed. And so we want to get a good waste that is easy to recycle and uh, gives a lot of natural food. Next slide, please. Uh, why it, uh, we do that? Um, normally, the waste is low in carbon and microorganisms need energy to uh, process the nutrients in the waste. And in each step, we lose 90% of the energy. And that means we have a quick depletion of energy and uh, a low production of natural food in the system. Next slide, please. And so it, uh, we are therefore, by focusing both on the animal and the pond during feed formulation to get a good waste. Next slide, please. And we do that by uh, adding carbohydrate in the feed and through the feed, try to get a lot of carbohydrate in the feces that are produced by the fish. And we do that by putting low quality ingredients in the feed that are rich in fibers. And that, uh, in that way, we get more carbon. The fibers, the fish cannot digest, but the microorganisms in the pond can use it, uh, the fibers as an energy source. And in that way, we stimulate the food web. Next slide, please. And when we do that, we see that with a normal feed, where we get a low energy waste, we get good production on the feed and also contribution of natural food. 
that with our nutritious feed, we, we give in on the quality of the feed directly for the animal that we grow. But in the same time, we stimulate the food web much better. And the result is that the feed and the natural food together give more production in the system. Next slide, please. And so with, uh, this is a way of working on ecological intensification. For the farmer, he gets a cheaper feed because he uses at uh, low quality ingredients. Um, he gets a higher production and he gets an easier management because with the feed, he also manages his water quality. So we create a healthy environment and at, uh, uh, with healthy food produced for the fish, producing healthy animals. And in doing so, with, uh, we contribute to the circular economy. Next slide, please. So uh, i like uh, to thank you for your time. We will now pass on the floor to our moderator, Dr. Nigel Preston, honorary professor in the School of Biological Science of the University of Queensland, and the chair of the Independent Steering Committee of the FISH CRP. Dr. Nigel, the floor is yours. Thank you, and, and thank you very much, Prof. Verdigam and, and Dr. Yosef, for giving such an uh, interesting introductory presentation, outlining the key principles and outcomes of this very important research uh, on both sustainable feeds and feeding practices. Uh, for the audience, if you have any questions or comments for Prof. Verdigam and Dr. Yosef, kindly submit them to the Q&A box. Um, and our, our colleague Killian will be moderating accordingly. Let's uh, shift our attention to our four panel members and hear their thoughts on the presentation by our two scientists and the authors of the brief. But first up, we have Prof. Hiet Virkiges, who is Head of Aquaculture and Fisheries at Wageningen University and Research. Before heading up the Aquaculture and Fisheries Group at the University, uh, Prof was a professor of cell biology. As such, his personal interest in fish, in fish immunology has broadened to include the interaction between fish nutrition and health in aquatic production systems. So, Prof, uh, what are your thoughts on today's discussion? Uh, for me, the research you just heard is important for, for at least three reasons. Um, the exact composition of the diet uh, that you want to test is dependent where you test it in, in which aquaculture system. Um, second, not only proteins and fat, but also carbohydrates have a clear nutritional value, at least for certain fish species. And then third, the aquaculture form of aqua ecological intensification, as just presented by the two, uh, two authors, can help, to meet, can help meet the, the growing demand for fish products. So that was very short, so let me explain this a bit further. Well, first of all, on diet. An optimal diet needs to meet all nutrient requirements of the fish species investigated and under the relevant conditions. So that's what I meant. Optimal diets are not the same when you determine them in clean freshwater aquaria when you compare them with a real life pond situation. So in a pond, there's also present a natural food web. And a diet optimal for pond aquaculture also aims to improve the natural food web. On the carbohydrates, fish nutritionists often consider carbohydrates as having no nutritional value. But this research proves them wrong. So far, many studies were, were based on carnivorous fish, like salmonids, but herbivorous fish, like tilapia and carp, can handle carbohydrates quite well. The studies we discussed today even showed that in pond systems, non-digestible carbohydrates, like dietary fibers, they have a clear value by feeding the natural food wrap. And then last but not least, the ecological intensification. Currently, much of the global production of fish is driven by aqua feeds. But today, the competition for nutrients between food and feed is increasing. 
and aquaculture will need to lower to valorize lower quality feed ingredients such as rice bran and wheat bran and they're both rich in the carbohydrates that I just mentioned. So therefore, these studies can be seen as a first and sustainable step towards meeting the future demand for fish and fish products. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very insightful comments, Prof. Um, now let's uh, move on to Professor Bernadette Frigine, who's the Aquaculture Compact Leader for the Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, uh, shortened to TAT, but World Fish and is based in Nigeria. Um, Prof has uh, more than 30 years of working experience in aquaculture for improved livelihoods. In her role, she facilitates the delivery of new technologies along the aquaculture value chain to develop the capacity of small-scale fish farmers. Uh, Prof, the next two minutes are yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. From our experience, the major challenges of small-scale fish farmers to adopt better feeding practices in the, in the 12 countries we have worked with, with the fish farmers, the first one is the lack of finance. They have problem of inadequate fund to feed their fish, and usually the feed feeding of the fish takes 60 to 80 percent of the operating cost. The other fa factor challenge is the low level of education and the need for more demonstrations that are more convincing. Usually small-scale fish farmers are very doubtful in adopting new innovations and always believe their local ways is the best because they are not willing to take risk. When the better feeding practice is demonstrated to them and, and the extension agent or the researcher can prove that the result is better than their current practice, then you can be sure that the adoption rate will be high and the fish farmers will be convinced about the technology. Another factor is the inadequate knowledge on the benefit of better feeding practices on their productivity. That is the food conversion ratio. Can you convince them that you'll get a higher food conversion ratio? And then lastly, there's also the need to sensitize and train these far uh, farmers on the, on, on, on the benefit of better feeding practices on their production and income. If you can convince them that using this feeding practice, you will have a higher profit margin from 30% to 50%, you can be sure they will adopt the technology with gladly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette. And those are compelling statistics. Um, I believe our next speaker can add his input to, uh, to, to, to that from the, from the market, uh, dis distribution and trade perspective. Uh, Dr. Harden Rome is the Strategic Marketing Director uh, in Asia at, at Scretting, uh, which is the world's largest manufacturer and supplier of um, aquaculture feeds. For the for past 10 years, his focus has been on enabling modern aquaculture through sustainable aquafeed in Africa and Asia. So Dr. Roma, can you, can you give us a brief take on, on the earlier presentation? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. And I'm very enthusiastic about the research presented today by uh, Mark Verdeven and Roderick Jossa. <clears throat> Traditionally, research on exploiting natural food in ponds was primarily aimed at uh, improving extensive fish farming systems which I characterize as low input or no input systems and giving very low output. And small scale farmers deserve better. Therefore, I'm very glad to see that the research in nutritious ponds proves the concept of uh, feeding the, both the fish and the natural uh, ecosystem 
works in practice. And that diets lower in protein specs can actually increase production and production efficiency for the small-scale fish farmer. So that is very important. Moreover, these systems also show to be more robust and reduce the, uh, the risk for disease, thereby contributing to more predictable farming systems, which is also uh, to the advantage of, of any farmer, but particularly small-scale farmers. And then when we can produce these type of diets with locally produced feed ingredients or byproducts or, or utilizing waste streams, uh, for sure we can make these uh, diets uh, more sustainable and sustainability also includes uh, profitability for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, that's strong endorsement of the research from uh, someone who's a world leader in the aquafeeds domain um, and reminder to the audience if you have any questions uh, for any of our panelists please submit them to the Q&A box. Um, our final panel member is Dr Sujata Ganguly um, who's the South Asia Gender Empowerment and Social Inclusion Lead of Includevate, an organization that offers monitoring evaluation and research services for international development institutions, partners and companies operating in low income countries. Um, her focus is on gender research, communication research and monitoring evaluation and learning activities in the field of migration, agriculture and maternal and child health. She's currently involved in work to transform food systems through partnerships and capacity building of small scale, to small -scale fish farmers. So, uh, Dr. Ganguly, over to you for the for your reflections. Thank you so much. Um, this is indeed a, a very important topic to discuss um, because to reduce costs, especially in low-income countries, um, alternative, uh, affordable, and nutritious fish feeds need to be found. However, any change towards commercialization of feeds or the introduction of new ingredients may create competition or strain on other aspects. Uh, small scale aquaculture uh, production or livelihood system. Thus, there is a need for alternative local ingredients that can mitigate the escalating cost of traditional fish feed without incurring these perverse consequences. And um, there is potential to promote a women's enterprise or employment in affordable local fish feed markets. Uh, women or any other uh, marginalized groups are already involved like in aquaculture in a number of ways. However, um, unequal social or gender norms continue to exclude them from extension services in one way or in other, uh, and also uh, in more lucrative areas of the agriculture value chain. Uh, moreover, uh, especially if you talk about women, they lack access to credit for business development, and any assets that are often in the name uh, of their spouses, we talk about uh, pond, farm, or any other resources, but generally like those are, they don't have uh, maybe the control over those resources or the assets. Uh, the full, these full range of factors shaping women and men uh, adopt and how they can use aquaculture innovation um, is, has been understudied. So particularly surrounding the gender power relations and dynamics. Um, so, uh, yes, definitely I find this topic very much interesting and much needed topic to discuss. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dan Guli, and, and indeed to the, to the rest of the panellists for all your reflections. Uh, we're, we're excited to hear more from you um, and, and all the panellists in, in the following panel session. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're going to start that panel discussion and uh, on, on these innovation strategies to, to drive the sustainable production and accessible use of aquatic fish feeds for small scale fish farmers, probably one of the most critical issues facing small scale fish farmers. Uh, and by the way, don't forget to send your questions uh, to this panel and we'll address them via the QA um, format. So um, basically, 
uh, I'm going to open up to the, the panel to, to ask, what do you see as significant or innovative about the nutritious pump concept? Thank you so much for giving me the word again. So for me, um, the real innovations or the, the key messages, if you like, are, and, and I can't repeat this often enough, the relatively easy way to improve feed accessibility for small-scale fish farmers by incorporating low-quality feed ingredients, being rich in the already discussed carbohydrates. For me, this is crucial if you want to have inclusive growth of aquaculture. Second, and the nutrition pond feeds, which, I mean, as a, as a professor at university, I really appreciate the concept approach. The feeds not only nourish the farmed fish, but also the food web that helps to break down fish waste and help to produce natural fish food. This is a true win-win situation with even an added bonus, the ingredient compo composition makes the feed less expensive than conventional feeds. So with an increasing focus on sustainability and food feed competition, I do think the proposed use of local and underutilized and, and inexpensive agricultural co-products as, as fish feed ingredients, it really helps in a great and, and very elegant way to reduce dependency on ingredients that otherwise can also be consumed by us, by humans. So last, if I may, I really appreciate the use of simple applications such as smartphone apps that help local feed millers and farmers to formulate their own nutritious pond feeds from their own local ingredients. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Ed. And, and it's clear that this is, a, this is an innovation that's, that's having impact and very good to get uh, your insights for someone so experienced. Maybe uh, ask Arjan to, to, to get his view on, on the significance of this project. Yeah, so I already endorsed uh, the outcome of the research. Uh, for me, the most, yeah, the innovative part of it was actually the idea of feeding both the fish and the, the system at the same time with, with, with feed, through feed. But what was the significance of this project? Um, for me, it was not that farmers now can use cheaper feed because cheaper feed alone is not a goal to me. And quite often, cheaper feed uh, is lower quality, uh, lower nutritional quality. And, and that is not what small-scale farmers need. I often say that uh, small-scale farmers deserve the same quality as large farming groups. Uh, actually, they can learn from large farming groups in that sense. Secondly, uh, yeah, we, we see here an improvement of, let's say, nutrient recycling, which is, of course, uh, great for circularity. But also, I feel this is not the most pressing issue for a small-scale farmer. He has other, uh, other concerns, like food security. But... And it is also not about reducing external input. Often it is said, yeah, we need to use less feed. Uh, no, not necessarily so. But so for me, the, the really interesting and significant outcome of this research is that we are able, with this nutritious pond feed, to increase the output for the small-scale farmer. So we're not giving something, uh, producing a little bit less, a little bit cheaper. No, we, we're producing something that is improving his performance and also helping his ecosystem to become more stabilized, which can also be a problem for, for small, remote, uh, located uh, uh, fish farmers. So he will have, he or she, of course, fish farmers can be uh, female as well. Uh, we'll have a more predictable farming uh, system in the end. And everybody is looking for predictability in the industry. Also, 
uh, when you are looking for credit for as a large farmer or you're looking for microcredit as a small farmer, you need to show that your system is predictable. And this nutritious bond diet uh, can contribute to that. Thank you. Will you allow me, Mr. Chairman, to react to this? Please, please do. Uh, yes. Thank, thank you. Well, I, I would like to, uh, to, to say thank you to my colleague, who, of course, works from, from a nutritional practice. And, and I, I like to thank him for more or less, let's say, correcting my typical scientist view. Um, but still, I would say, as a scientist, for us, closing a nutrient cycle is of interest. And uh, we're not only here, I think, as scientists to help achieve ambitious goals to, to feed a growing world population with, with healthy fish and fish products, but we're also here to achieve a maybe even more ambitious goal, to educate the next generation. For us as scientists, uh, concept thinking, such as designing nutritious pond feeds, closing nutrient cycles, the truly and, and really important to trigger and, and optimize, uh, I would almost say, the brains of our students that will be leading the next generation. Of course, this, this sounds very ambitious, but yeah, we like to be ambitious. And of course, um, I, and I have to acknowledge the, the practical experience of my colleague here from industry, increasing output per pond per cycle, more efficient production, they're of real life value. Of course, I, I appreciate that modern fish farming is about improving pred predictability. But as a scientist at Wageningen, I can allow myself a bit of naivety, I would almost say. And I'd like to keep dreaming about, about robust and, and stable ecosystems with lower risk of disease, not only to receive the, the necessary microcredits, but also to preserve our natural resources for the longer term. And, and with this hopeful message for a sustainable future, I would like to give back the word to the chair. Thank you again for reminding us uh, about the footprint that we that we leave uh, and trying to do better in the future. Um, so, so moving on, um, the next question for the panel: from from your experience, what are the key challenges for small scale fish farmers to adopt better feeding practices, uh, i.e., convincing farmers to use them, um, access to training? Uh, using ICT finances, digital technologies, how can we come overcome some of these challenges? And I'm going to pass that uh, question to to Bernadette first. To overcome the challenges of um, the issue of the access to training, to overcome these challenges. There's a need for us to train, to make training available for the fish farmers on modern feeding practices. And it's also important for them to be made aware the ingredients that are available. These ingredients which are available. I know the ICT is not very common in African countries with fish farmers, but this is the reason why fish farmers have to be trained on having access to ICT training. Because virtually all fish, uh, fish farmers in Africa, they have access to the internet. And if you have access to a phone, you have access to internet, you have access to data. And it is possible for them to be trained on the use of ICT so that they can improve their feeding practices. For instance, uh, last year, Roderick had an opportunity to train the Francophone and Anglophone countries on better, um, on fish feed formulation and uh, production. I believe that this type of system should be encouraged for our partners or African fish farmers to be able to have access to better feed practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette. And, and uh, Sujita, would you perhaps uh, uh, add your views on that? Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it has been well said, like, there are many uh, challenges for small-scale fish farmers, and um, if they sit and start writing down the list, it will just go on and on. So um, what exactly do we need? And like, as we have already uh, discussed and brought up this topic that uh, regarding their access to uh, um, assets or control over the resources, the education level, their uh, inadequate knowledge, or so uh, extension services. So yes, the, it's, there are many challenges. And um, in addition to that, um, an increasing body of research explores uh, low cost fish feed made of local ingredients as alternatives to conventional uh, and expensive feed. And uh, these ingredients uh, include plant proteins such as soybean meal, uh, papaya, cucumber, etc. And the competitive use of these feeds and any potential risk associated with their intensification and commercialization have not been adequately explored. So uh, women might feed these local ingredients to livestock or use them in other types of livelihood activities. Um, redirecting these ingredients may not actually be sustainable uh, if it comes at a different cost. So the cost implication of this warrants further studies and exploration along with adopting a gender and social law. And uh, definitely context-specific feed solutions are needed depending on the local ecology. And uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So ba back to Sujita, basically following up on the previous questions, uh, how do we ensure inclusive development when it comes to sustainable feeds and feeding practices? What are the risks uh, what risk must we keep in mind with regards to often marginalised social groups, including women and youth? So Interesting. Uh, so, as uh, uh, already been said, that extension services relating to seed innovations may uh, reach, engage with, or and respond predominantly to men's needs and preferences. So uh, men will hear about, learn about, and take advantage of any new opportunity arising from the use of local ingredients for affordable and nutritious fish feed before women. So the risk of that, uh, women may further be marginalized and miss out on opportunities for income growth and control. And uh, here I should also mention that it's just not about women, but also the other marginalized groups. Uh, that we are talking about. Um, and women or other groups may get uh, underrepresented in projects or policies related to fish food initiatives and may not get the benefit of data extension services or policies and institutional practices mm -hmm. as direct, uh, directed to them. So most of them like, do not have the kind of resources required to continuously invest in fish ponds and their lack of control over technology or innovation, and combined with their lower educational attainment in some context, means that they are overlooked by extension and training opportunities. So the risk is that this reproduces women's subordination and lowers their opportunity to be economically independent and, um, they, and have that agency or the decision-making power over new technology. Um, for example, the potential local ingredients uh, for fish feed uh, may already be allocated for other purposes, such as providing feed for chickens or goats, on which um, here I'm taking the example of women, like on which women rely heavily for autonomous income. So it is therefore important that this wider area of innovation, that is the low cost local fish feed, recognizes the potential social and the gender risk associated with the diversion of these ingredients into fish feed and including potential impact on smallholder livelihoods and well-being, especially the poor women and marginalized groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Heer, could I ask you for a, for a quick response to, to, to that? Well, uh, I'll try to give a, a quick response indeed. I, I mentioned before improving feed accessibility for small-scale fish farmers. It's crucial to the inclusive growth of aquaculture. But how does it relate to marginalized social groups? It's a very good question. Well, well first, I think it's good to be aware that it's very simple. Having your own pond operation simply and, and very directly contributes to one's own household nutrition. 
So when you have a local nutritious pond, household nutrition is, is, is about bringing healthy fish to the table. But if you take it uh, from a wider perspective, um, conventional fish feeds often remain inaccessible to many small-scale fish farmers just because of the prohibitive costs. Well, when you cannot afford to buy formulated feeds up front or you lack the training and skills to make a profit with formulated feeds, then many are forced to rely on homemade feeds. And the approach we discussed today provides farmers with the tools to formulate their own diets using locally available ingredients with their own community, including the participation of marginalized social groups. And maybe most relevant here, especially in small farmer households, women participate in the farming activity and they, they often even lead the fish farming operation. So therefore, the nutritious pond concept can be considered particularly important for women and for youth in the aquaculture sector who often have less income and fewer assets and greater barriers when accessing inputs. So what would be the key risk for me? would be to forget to also train and educate these social groups. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Sudita, maybe um, just a quick response to, to, those, to those comments. Uh, no, I uh, totally agree to uh, what has been said because uh, given these challenges, uh, there exists a risk that any negative changes brought about by the introduction of the new ingredients and taking into uh, consideration the small scale uh, farmers right from the beginning, that's the best uh, opportunity uh, for them and uh, definitely uh, that will ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much for that strong message in relation to inclusivity. Um, moving forward, what, what is needed to scale the uptake uh, and use of nutrition pond feeds and or local novel feed ingredients. Uh, I'll pass that one to Arjen. Well, first of all, I think, uh, yeah, training on this concept is needed for uh, small scale farmers. I think at the moment they are not always aware that uh, the pond they are using is, uh, is an ecosystem. So changing to those type of diets requires education. There's also uh, a sense in farmers that the more protein uh, in the diet, the better, or the label. So there, yeah, I, I think also there we have to uh, bring a bring a better uh, uh, communication. Um, also, the feed industry itself has probably some challenges with this because they cannot always deliver feed directly to small-scale farmers. Often they use distributors. So the contact is indirect. Therefore, we also do not know always exactly how they will use our feeds or how intensive their system is. So that definitely also needs uh, yeah, good communication in the value chain. Um, maybe as a last point, on, on the raw material side, so local raw materials, yes, we can use them if they are available in, in uh, sufficient uh, volumes and, and consistent quality and, and, and so forth. So also there, uh, yeah, quality assurance is very important even though you're using local uh, ingredients. And in many countries, there's a protein scarcity. So uh, regardless of the type of diet that we make, uh, we need more protein uh, feedstuffs uh, locally produced. And, uh, there are initiatives like insect meal, but uh, they, yeah, they will re require time to become uh, cost effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Bernadette, uh, maybe a, a quick response for you and a clarity around that, uh, particularly at the last point, but you know, protein is a scarcity uh, and uh, you know what your views on the on the nutritious pond technology bringing some relief in that respect, and and what are the opportunities for other innovations? So uh, a few were mentioned, including the insect meal. What 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 are your what are your views on that? Okay, um, concerning the insect meal, 
I support it, but it cannot be used for more than 30%. From my experience with fish farmers, they use the inclusion of insect meal more above 30% will result to fatty fish. And because you are in Africa, we add value and we smoke, that kind of fish will not be, go very well on the, on the, on, for smoking. That is one. And then for the other aspects of uh, the use of nutritious uh, feed, no, novel feed ingredients to be used for fish farmers, I will support the former speaker who also said there's a need for increase of education, increased awareness of local available ingredients for fish feed production. The farmers have to be made aware of what other local ingredients are available. Then secondly, fish farmers must have some level of, of education to be taught on the feeding practices. And, as, and then the, the uh, integrated culture system should also be in, in, encouraged, like for catfish, for tilapia and carp. Can I continue? I think, look, they were really valuable insights, but we want to try to get um, um, some of the uh, audience questions uh, okay. to, to the panel. So look, thank, thank you. you very much for all those pan panelists. And now uh, I would like to... Uh, begin the open dialogue with all the panelists to answer some of the questions that you've all been uh, feed, feeding in. Can nutritious pond feeds for fish have an impact on the quality, uh, the nutritional quality of the, of the fish? So, so maybe over to Achen for that, uh, or any of the panelists who might have a crack at that. Well, that, that could be a topic uh, for uh, one or two hours. But uh, let's say in general, not in general, uh, the protein, whether it comes from natural food or from the feed, it will be digested into amino acids and the fish will use it as building blocks for, uh, for protein and, and, and good fish uh, quality. So there are no immediate uh, concerns uh, uh, or fish quality, to my opinion. All right. So, thank you. Can so, I say so, yes, please. I have a different opinion. The quality of feed you feed a fish, the feed type of feed affects the texture of the fish. In Africa, we know that when you feed fish fed with scratching feed, for example, compounded feed throughout. The, the texture is excellent. But when you now feed fish with some other inputs, like I told you about the, about the, 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 the mag meal, when it's above a particular percentage, and that's why we should understand the various ingredients that have been proved to have excellent taste on the fish. I don't know about others, but my own personal experience as an extensionist I know that what you feed a fish affects the quality of the flesh. Like if you feed a fish with, uh, with chicken waste, the texture will, but there must be a particular percentage, low percentage, so that it will not destroy the quality of the flesh. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Thank Thank you, ben. you Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have uh, time for more or audience questions? I think we're a bit tight for time if we're going to close on time, Nigel. Okay. So right. We might. Uh, uh, we've got all those questions online and, uh, um, and, and maybe um, get some of those answered in that way. So I should uh, um, thank the panel for all their valuable contributions. And, and as we're approaching the, the close, I'll hand over to, uh, to, back to Mike. Okay, the big thanks, Nigel, for, um, for, 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 for leading the panel, chairing the panel. Um, big thanks to Rodrigue and uh, Mark for your pres presentations that uh, set the whole, uh, set the scene there. And, um, 
Uh, a big thanks to everyone working behind the scenes. And uh, lastly, thank you so much to the audience. We had, uh, I think, 130 um, participants, which is, uh, which, which is amazing. Um, really great set of questions. I'm, I'm really sorry we, we couldn't you know, get to them. A lot answered, but we'll, we'll circulate the, um, the, we'll make sure that we do provide a response to every question and that will be circulated um, along with a link and to this, uh, the recording and a link to the brief that gives more, um, more, more detail in a succinct way of the research, the results, and the, um, the, some suggestions on the way forward. So from all of us involved with the um, FISH uh, CRP, big thanks for the participation. Um, we hope you found the discussion valuable and um, look forward to real uh, collaboration with, with, with all here. To, um, to, to move this, this key area um, of uh, aquaculture uh, further, further forward. So thanks also to um, but Malcolm Beveridge, Nisha Mawaha working in the background to um, develop the, uh, and support the strategic brief and the World Fish Communications team for a really um, super organized event. Um, we have a number of um, Fish for Thoughts following. The next Fish for Thought will be focused on youth in small-scale fisheries and aquaculture. We touched on it today, and uh, we'll have a, an hour session to talk more about the challenges and opportunities for youth. As part of our celebration of International Youth Day on August the 12th, so we hope to see you then. So once again, Warm thank you from me, um, Fish CRP team. And uh, if you have any further comments or would like to get in touch, you can visit us online at fish.cgr.org. So thanks again, everyone. Appreciate the time and your participation and help in so many ways. With that, happy to close the uh, webinar for today. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Stay safe, stay well everyone, bye for now.